Hello, Mr Hardy here, and in this video I would like to teach you about the poem Flag by John Agard. We'll start by reading the poem, um, we'll then check we understand what's going on in the poem. Uh, next we'll identify uh, the poem's key message and where we can explore conflict in the poem. Uh, moving on, we'll identify the key language, structure and poetic techniques that Agard employs in his poem. Um, and finally, I'll leave you with a couple of activities you can do after the video to solidify your understanding of Flag by Agard. So, John Agard, he is a poet and a playwright. Um, he's originally from Guyana, uh, formerly called British Guyana, um, and this is a country in South America. Um, however, he now lives in England with his wife, Grace Nichols. Um, she is also a poet, um, and I recommend if you have time to read some of her poetry um, because it's very enjoyable. Uh, Agard was born in 1949, and he is still alive today at the time I'm making this video, which is early 2023. Um, so that makes Agard a contemporary poet who deals with the issues of our time in his poetry. So let's get into it. Flag by John Agard. What's that fluttering in a breeze? It's just a piece of cloth that brings a nation to its knees. What's that unfurling from a pole? It's just a piece of cloth that makes the guts of men grow bold. What's that rising over a tent? It's just a piece of cloth that dares the coward to relent. What's that flying across a field? It's just a piece of cloth that will outlive the blood you bleed. How can I possess such a cloth? Just ask for a flag, my friend, then blind your conscience to the end. So what is going on in this five stanza poem? Um, the first thing you need to understand is that there are two speakers in this poem. There are two voices or personas. Um, speaker one is asking a question in line one of each stanza. What's that? Um, and they're trying to identify a flag. And speaker two answers speaker one in lines two and three of the poem. Um, in line two, speaker two tends to say it's just a piece of cloth. Um, and that gets repeated throughout most of the stanzas. Um, but in line three, speaker two offers a really interesting image of a flag. Um, and the reason this image is so interesting is because it highlights some of the positive qualities of a flag and also some of the negative qualities of a flag. Uh, and this idea is repeated throughout stanza one, two, three and four. Um, stanza five at the end of the poem is slightly different, and I will explain how it's different later on in the video. So what is the poem's message? Um, I believe in flag, Agard is providing a warning about extreme nationalism and patriotism. Um, so what do these terms mean? Uh, nationalism is when you put your nation's needs ahead of other people's needs. Um, for example, you may live in a country where you're running out of a resource such as food. Um, and as a result of this, your nation decides to invade another nation in order to take their food resource. This is you putting your own needs ahead of other people's needs. Um, and this is nationalism. Patriotism is having a real passionate devotion or, or love towards your country. Um, usually symbolised through a flag. You might fly your flag from your window or from your car. Um, and if you're patriotic, you may believe your, your country is right in all situations, regardless of whether that's true or not. Um, and I believe in this poem, flag, uh, in this poem flag, Agard is delivering a warning about extreme forms of nationalism and patriotism and how it might be harmful to the human race. So where can we find conflict in this poem? Um, well, first of all, I think in Flag, um, the implication is that extreme nationalism can breed physical conflict. Uh, a prime example of this would be Nazi Germany. Um, Adolf Hitler 
uh, through his nationalistic ideology of, of a master race, an Aryan race, um, inspired the German people. Um, and, and this resulted in a war um, that affected the whole world, uh, mainly across Europe, and resulted in millions of people's deaths. And that physical conflict was a result of a nationalistic idea. Secondly, I believe uh, Agard is saying that if you are nationalistic, um, let's say you are a soldier who serves your nation, serves your flag, um, you may suffer internal consequences as a result because you might ignore your good human nature, which is to, to love other people and, and have a real strong moral compass of what is right and what is wrong. You may ignore that part of you in order to be loyal to your flag, to be nationalistic. Um, as a soldier, you might go and kill um, the enemy and you might go and conquer land. And actually, you're no longer being a, a loving human being um, as a result of the symbol of the flag and the nationalistic ideas. Um, you're committing some quite evil acts. So the techniques Agard employs in this poem. Um, linguistically, Agard makes interesting use of verbs. Um, he uses alliteration and consonants to direct the reader's attention to his imagery. Um, and he makes use of questions to force the readers to really think about flags and, and the idea of nationalism and patriotism. Structurally speaking, um, flag is made up of five stanzas. Um, each stanza has three lines. There is a tight syllabic structure and there is also a rhyme scheme. And each line has a, a specific purpose, a specific structure, a goal. Um, so overall, what you need to know is that this poem is very tightly structured and very controlled. Um, and poetically speaking, uh, Agard employs anaphora. Um, some people call it a refrain. Uh, this is when you repeat a word or a phrase in a poem. Um, Agard employs imagery. Um, I believe all good poets use imagery to some extent. They're trying to paint a memorable image in the reader's mind. Um, Agard makes interesting use of tone. Uh, tone is the emotions behind the words. Um, and at the end, um, in stanza five, Agard employs a volta. A volta is when there is a change of tone within a poem. So let's explore these techniques in detail, stanza by stanza. So stanza one, let's start with uh, the structural notes in blue. Um, Line one is where speaker one asks a question. Um, this is quite clearly identifiable by the question mark at the end of line one. Um, speaker two then answers the question in lines two and three. Uh, if you look at the top right of the screen, I've identified the purpose of each line. Line one is a question. Um, if you want a fancier word for this, you can say interrogative. Uh, line two is where we have our anaphora or a frame, our repeated phrase. Um, and line three is where Agard presents us with this image of a flag that has positive and negative connotations. Um, next to the purpose of each line, I've identified how many syllables each line has. Line one has eight syllables, line two, six syllables, and line three, also eight syllables. Um, this is a very tight, very controlled structure. Um, add on to this the rhyme that you can see in lines one and three, breeze and knees. Um, the overall effect is a really tightly structured and controlled poem. And I believe that this is symbolic of a flag's ability to control and tightly um, manipulate people. Um, that's why I believe Agard has, has used a tight structure in his poem to reflect um, a flag's ability to control people. Um, looking at the bottom right in green, um, each line has a distinct tone, a distinct emotion. Uh, line one, what's that fluttering in a breeze? Um, this is quite a naive tone. Naive means childish. Um, speaker one has seen a cloth on a pole fluttering in the breeze and is unable to identify it. Um, they, they don't know what a flag is. Um, to me, even children probably know what a flag is. So this speaker is clearly very naive. Um, speaker two then responds to the question in line two by saying it's just a piece of cloth. And this is repeated um, throughout the first four stanzas. 
Um, and I think this creates quite a disinterested tone. Speaker two is, is a bit bored of speaker one's silly questions. What's that fluttering in the breeze? Well, duh, it's, it's a flag. It's just a piece of cloth. It's not that important. Why are you so fixated on it? Um, however, that disinterested tone becomes quite profound in, in line three because speaker two offers an explanation of what a flag is through an image um, and provides quite a complex image of a flag as it can be positive and it can be negative. So line one is, is naive, line two is disinterested, line three is profound, and this tone is consistent across the first four stanzas. Uh, let's have a look at line one um, and that verb fluttering. What's that fluttering in a breeze? Um, this is a verb and it's quite positive. Um, when I think of things that flutter, I personally think of a butterfly, and I find butterflies quite beautiful. And I think that Agard is suggesting that flags can be beautiful in terms of their colours, in terms of how a flag moves in a breeze. But I think Agard is warning us, don't get caught up on how beautiful the flag looks, because if you dig a little deeper, you'll find that the flag is a symbol of nationalism, and that can be quite manipulative and controlling and dangerous. Um, when we get to this image in, in line three of the flag that brings a nation to its knees, um, Agard uses alliteration, the N sound in nation and knees, to draw our attention to this image. And as a reader, when we stop and think about this image, um, we might consider that there are positive sides to a flag. Um, when you kneel down, um, you might be praying or you might be showing some kind of respect um, and flags can do that. Um, if you fly a flag, it can make soldiers salute. It might make people kneel down patriotically. Um, flags can be positive. They can inspire devotion and respect. However, this image of kneeling down, an entire nation kneeling, um, thousands of people on their knees, I think that's quite um, an, an, an image of being subdued or being overpowered. Um, if one nation conquers another nation, it might force um, the people of the conquered nation to their needs, to beg for their lives, um, to maybe be servants or slaves to the conquering nation. Um, so clearly here that the flag it can either inspire respect or it can be used to overpower and to bully other people. If we move on to stanza two, we'll see that structurally it's it's the same. Um, the only difference is uh, pole and bold. The rhymes in line one and two is a, in one and three is a half rhyme instead of a full rhyme. Uh, but again, the tone is consistent in lines one, two, and three. Um, line one is a question: What's that unfurling from a pole? Again, the verb unfurling is very positive and, and reminds me of butterflies. Um, I imagine a caterpillar um, becoming a chrysalis and then a chrysalis unfurling and becoming a, a butterfly. Again, it's very beautiful. Flags can be very beautiful. Um, but I think there is a warning that if you look a bit deeper, flags can be dangerous. Uh, in response to this question, speaker two answers with it's just a piece of cloth. This repeated refrain, this anaphora creates quite a disinterested tone. Um, that being said, that clever imagery in line three um, gives us a lot to think about that makes the guts of men grow bold. Um, here it's saying that flags can inspire courage. So I imagine maybe a soldier on the battlefield um, might be feeling quite intimidated or quite scared. However, when they think of the flag and they think of the country they're serving and the people back home they're protecting, um, that might inspire courage in them and they might gain the courage to, to stand up and fight the enemy. Um, and I believe that's symbolized by guts. Um, for example, if, if a friend was trying to dare me to do something dangerous and I said I didn't want to do it, my friend might say, ah, oh, clearly you don't have the guts to do it. So we tend to link this idea of having guts with being brave. Um, however, the negative consequence of this image um, is that if your guts grow bold, I think this is an image of someone bleeding out. Um, so I believe your guts are, are sort of like a brownish colour, your internal organs. Um, but when they grow bold, they become 
more visual. And I think this is maybe because all the blood is sort of spilling out, maybe from a, a stomach wound. Maybe your a soldier has been impaled or shot in the stomach. Um, and now sort of the blood is burbling and, and squirting out around their guts. And it's turning their brown guts um, from quite a dull colour into quite a bold colour. Um, now, obviously, if, if you are injured in your organs, um, the result is probably a, a slow and painful death. So again, the flag can make you brave. It can inspire you to get up and fight and, and achieve incredible acts. Um, but actually, the consequence of some of those actions might be that, that you die. Um, and the flag is, again, responsible for that. Uh, Agard uses the, the alliteration of the g sound, the gottle gl g in guts and grow to draw our attention to this image. Stanza three is, is structurally the same. Um, we have a full rhyme though in lines one and three, tent and relent. Um, and again, the question that speaker one asks in line one has a positive verb. What's that rising over a tent? Um, when I think of things that rise, I think of maybe sunrises, which are quite beautiful. Um, I may even think of bread rising as a result of yeast. Um, it's quite a positive image of a flag. Uh, speaker two is still pretty disinterested. They're replying with their anaphora. It's just a piece of cloth. Um, however, they also add their really clever imagery in line three, that there's the coward to relent. Um, instead of alliteration, here Agard is using consonants. Um, consonants is when you repeat a sound within a word. Um, alliteration is when you repeat the sound at the beginning of the word. Um, also with consonants, you're repeating a consonant sound. Um, and in this example, it's the R sound in there's coward and relent. So this image uh, there, uh, that, there's the de that, that there's the coward to relent, um, there's a positive connotation to this image. Um, if you're a coward, it means you're scared. And if you relent, it means you're about to give up. Um, so what can happen is, let's say a soldier who is losing a battle, they've lost a lot of ground, they've lost a lot of men, um, their heart may grow cowardly. They may want to surrender, to give in, to wave the white flag. However, when they think of their home flag, their country's flag, and again, the people they're protecting and serving, this flag might inspire courage within them to not be a coward, to not relent and give in, and to continue fighting to the bitter end. Um, however, this, this courage can result in conscription. Um, conscription is when you force people, you encourage people to join the army and, and serve the military. And this usually happens during a time of war. Now, some people might not want to join the army and fight, and, and we would call these people conscientious objectors. Their conscience, their sense of right and wrong, um, makes them object um, with the idea of killing other people. Um, however, a lot of conscientious objectors have been labelled cowards, um, and by using a flag, you can apply peer pressure to people um, to try and convince them to go and serve in a war. So again, the flag has a positive ability to inspire courage in the face of danger and defeat. The flag can give you that extra strength to win the battle. Um, however, the flag can also coerce um, conscientious objectors into conscription, into mandatory military service and fighting for your flag, for your nationalistic um, ideals, for your country. In stanza four, um, again, we have a similar structure with our questions and answers um, and the anaphora and the imagery. Um, however, one thing to notice is that we have a half rhyme. Um, field and bleed is a half rhyme. Uh, again, we have a positive use of a verb in the question. What's that flying across a field? Um, when I think of flying, I think of freedom, maybe birds flying freely in the sky or maybe going on an aeroplane and flying to a holiday destination. Um, so here, again, flags can be positive, um, but if we think a bit deeper, they, they can be dangerous as well. Um, we get the anaphora, the refrain, it's just a piece of cloth. Um, 
but interestingly, Speaker 2 adds that image at the end that we can interpret positively and negatively. Uh, to draw our attention to this image, Agard has used alliteration um, by repeating the B sound in blood and bleed. Um, we are attracted to this uh, part of the poem, this image. Um, line three, that will outlive the blood you bleed. Um, there is a positive take on, on this line, um, and that is if you are a soldier um, and you die in battle, um, defending your country or fighting for your country, um, you tend to have to be remembered in the historical records. Maybe your home country will make a statue for you or a monument or a memorial. Uh, and in that sense, you outlive um, the fact that you're dead. You're sort of immortalised because of your nationalistic service. You have a kind of legacy left behind. Um, some people might find this, this really positive, the idea that, that they might die. Um, however, their country, their nation, their flag lives on um, and will continue to develop and, and get better. Uh, however, there is a flip side to this idea, and um, it's really highlighted with the alliteration of blood and bleed. And it's this idea that you're, you are dying for your flag, you're dying for your country. Um, and considering the average human lifespan is about 100 years, um, and we have some countries that are thousands of years old in their history. Um, you have your one shot at life. Are you really going to to die potentially prematurely um, for a country that, that's going to outlive you, that probably doesn't really care um, deeply about you, that is maybe just using you as a soldier to, to achieve their own um, political objective? Um, I think Agard's probably forcing us to think is is dying for your flag pointless? Um, is, it, is it worth it? Um, and I think it depends on who you ask. Uh, it will depend on, on what answer you will get. So in the final stanza, um, we see a change, a change in the structure, a change in the tone, uh, and we can call this change Volta. Um, we still have speaker one asking a question in line one, and we still have speaker two answering the question in lines two and three. However, line two is no longer a refrain, um, an anaphora, it's just an answer. Um, and in line three, our image um, doesn't have any positive connotations, it only has negative connotations. And as a result of these changes, um, the tone has changed. Uh, so if you remember in the previous four stanzas, the questions had quite a naive tone, a childish tone. Speaker one couldn't identify what a flag was. Um, but in stanza five, uh, the question, how can I possess such a cloth, has quite a greedy tone. Um, clearly, speaker one has worked out that flags are very powerful and manipulative, and now they want one to use for their own purpose. Um, line two, I believe, is still quite indifferent. Uh, just ask for a flag, my friend. Um, interestingly, uh, this is the, the first time we get the keyword flag, which is the title of the poem. Um, it comes in the penultimate line, the second to last line. Um, but here the tone is, is quite casual. Um, speaker two hasn't realised that speaker one is, is suddenly interested in this flag, maybe to use to their own benefit. So they're, they're just saying, just ask for a flag. You, you can get one of these anywhere. It's quite indifferent. Um, however, that final line, um, then blind your conscience to the end, uh, the tone, I think, is no longer profound. Um, it's no longer insightful. I think it's just a plain warning um, that if you are going to get this flag, um, you're going to have to give up your morality in order to use it. Uh, so let's explore it line by line. How can I possess such a cloth? Line one. Um, in the past, Agard was using uh, positive verbs. Um, however, possess is quite a negative verb. Um, it has ideas of ownership and control. Um, and if you really want to take it to an extreme, um, possessing, it could be like a, a ghost or a demon possessing a human soul. Um, and maybe a flag, um, if you sign up for these extreme nationalistic ideas, might possess your human soul, your human goodness and corrupt it. Um, the image at the end then blinds your conscience to the end. Um, Agard is again using consonants. Um, this time, He's repeating the N sound in blind conscience and end. 
to draw our attention to this image. Um, but this image has nothing positive about it. It's only negative. Um, blinding yourself, for removing um, one of your senses is quite negative. Um, blinding your conscience. Um, your conscience is that voice inside of you that tells you right from wrong, that provides you with your morals. Um, if you blind your conscience, you're, you're getting rid of your ability to feel right and wrong. You're sort of desensitizing yourself. Um, and Agard is warning us that flags have that ability to, um, to take away our humanity when we fight for a flag and as a result, kill and harm other people. Um, and then we end on the word end. Um, and I believe this is, this suggests sort of like the finality of, of a flag. It can, you can ultimately die. You can give the ultimate sacrifice, your life, or you could do the ultimate evil end someone else's life. Um, because a flag, because a nationalistic idea has taken hold of you, has possessed you. Um, this idea of finality is, is really cemented in the rhyming couplet at the end. Um, so in the previous four stanzas, uh, the rhyme came in lines one and three. Um, but by ending lines two and three on a rhyme, um, we call this a rhyming couplet, friend and end. Uh, this is a technique that Shakespeare also used um, in, in a lot of his plays when he wanted to bring a scene to an end. He'd make the last two lines rhyme and this will create quite a definitive, conclusive, strong ending. So there you have it. There is a lot of analysis there about Flag by John Agard. Um, I really hope you found that useful for your understanding of the poem and your revision of the poem. Um, my advice to you would be to make notes from this video on a physical copy of the poem, um, make notes about the message, about nationalism, um, patriotism, make notes about Agard himself, and of course those all important language, uh, poetic and structural techniques and the effects created. Um, you may want to go on to answer the question I've made up, how does Agard explore conflict in flag? It's quite an open-ended question. Um, I've suggested you structure it as follows. Um, you want to write a short introduction, um, maybe introducing the idea of a flag and the symbol of a flag and how it links to nationalism and patriotism and Agard's views on that. Um, in your next paragraph, you may want to look at the, the language he uses, um, maybe those positive verbs or those alliterations or assonance that draw our attention to the images. Um, in your next paragraph, you might want to look at this controlling structure, um, five stanzas, three lines, rhyme scheme, tight syllabic structure. Every line has a purpose, which creates a, an effect of control, a bit like how a flag may control you. Um, in your penultimate, second to last paragraph, you might want to look at those poetic features he used. Uh, remember, you can identify the repetition as anaphora or refrain. Um, I think it's definitely worth talking about that dual imagery um, of positive ideas about flags and negative ideas about flags. Um, and you may also want to include the volta and the change of tone at the end. And finally, you can come to your own conclusion as to how Agard explores conflict in flag uh, and what the purpose of the poem is and the meaning that he wants the reader to take away. So please, if you've liked this video and you found it useful for your studies, please like the video. Um, please also subscribe to my channel, Mr. Hardy, so you don't miss any other OCR poetry videos and my other videos on English language and literature. Um, and finally, please leave a comment with the next poem from the OCR anthology that you would like me to explain in a video. Thank you for your attention and I'll see you on the next one.